Welcome to worship this weekend with Calvary. We thank you for joining us and we pray that God would continue to gather us together as his people to celebrate all that he has done for us. So while there are many things that call for our attention in this world, is that we have every reason to hope. For we have all the love, all the mercy, all the grace of our God and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit to continue to journey with us, not only in our walk of faith, but also our very battle against sin. And so may God continue to bless you this day as we now join our voices together in that worship of our Lord Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins unto God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise to the Lord.
be with you and also with you let us pray almighty god by the working of your holy spirit set us free from the captivity of sin and selfishness so that we may serve in the freedom of your spirit through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god now and forever amen our Old Testament reading today com comes from Psalm 119. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our epistle reading today comes from Romans chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? Thus a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. 
And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So we now join together in speaking the Apostles' Creed as we continue to confess our faith in our triune God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. For I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Hi, we welcome the children that are joining us online at this time as we begin with a special message for them as well. So what I want you to think about today is how well do you do at welcoming others? So what I mean by that is in our gospel reading from Matthew today is that Jesus talks about welcoming others, receiving the the teachers of God's people, of receiving even the lowest and littlest and youngest disciples. And so it just stops and make us, makes us think, well, how, how are we at welcoming others in the right way? See, maybe I just can think about it this way. In your house, how do you determine who gets the first piece of pie? How do you determine is that who gets the biggest piece of pizza? Is that in your house, how do you determine who is going to get the first choice at the cookies? Is that, do you pick the biggest? Do you pick the best? Do you pick this or that? Is that when you think about having guests over or welcoming others into your house, do you think, well, First off, I, I need to take care of me. <laughs> or do we think about others first? See, Jesus talks today about welcoming. Is that he says that even if you give a cup of cold water to one of the littlest of these, is that I will give you a reward. So what is Jesus meaning by that? is that Jesus is reminding us that we are about that intentional welcome of love and grace to others. Is that how do we think about others versus ourselves? See, Paul today in our epistle lesson talks about how often we think with ourselves first. We think about our needs, our wants, our, 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 our. Kind of sound like pirates there. <laughs> See, I... I still remember hearing a story of two little boys that kind of found this struggle with them. Is that their mom was making them pancakes one morning and all of a sudden these two brothers started fighting of who was going to get the first one, who was going to get the biggest one, who was going to... And mom finally got upset and she saw that it was a time to tell them a little bit of a moral the story. And so what did she say is that, that if you think about what would Jesus do in this situation, 
what would Jesus do? Would Jesus want and take the first pancake or would he give it to his brother? Would Jesus be the one, I want the biggest one? Or would Jesus say, you have this? See, the mom felt it was a great teaching opportunity when the older brother said to the younger brother, all right, let's do that. You be Jesus. See, too often we think of ourselves first. But what is it that Jesus is reminding us? Not just to be nice, not just to welcome, not just to even care for the little, small acts of kindness like bringing a cup of cold water. But Jesus reminds us of him. See, do we always do well at all of this? But how did Jesus welcome those around him? That even when they mocked him, made fun of him, that he loved them. That even when they struck him and beat him and even spit on him, what did he say? He prayed, Father, forgive them. When they became angry, he became merciful. When they became selfish, he became even more giving. Is that Jesus reminds us that he has given us something far beyond anything that we can produce by ourselves. Not just how do we care for the other first, but how do we see of just how much Jesus has cared for us. That he has done much more than bring us just a little cup of cold water. That he has given us that very refreshing forgiveness of, of his very love for us as he gives to us that promise of the Holy Spirit that will lead us and guide us and refresh us all our days. And so would you please join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, we pray that you would this day pour out your spirit into our lives, that may we no longer live to sin and to live to ourselves, but help us by your spirit and your power to live to you, always remembering of just how much you loved us and just how gracious you were in your care for all those that you welcomed. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us.
Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The topic of our sermon today focuses upon our reading from our epistle of Romans chapter 7, beginning with the first verse. A couple of years ago, I found an article kind of humorous. It was a little spoof article that I unfortunately found a little bit too close to my life or at least some people's lives that I know. That this is how the title of the article read. Desperate for sermon illustration, local pastor spends time with his own kids. See, I love my kids and I love spending time with my kids. It's not just because they give me sermon illustrations, but I'll have to admit that I do kind of like that they do provide me some sermon illustrations. See, it's that very fact that no one can provide those insights into life quite as much as when you look into the lives of those immediately around you. See, I I want you to go ahead and look at this picture of my daughter Abigail from some years ago. Is that back in 2011, is that this is what she looked like. Innocent and sweet and cute and adorable. Is that there she was on that day that my parents had come into town to visit. Is that there we found ourselves in the Lincoln, Nebraska Children's Museum that we were having a grand and wonderful day. And there she is pictured with the different dress-up things that were going on that day. Yeah, back in the day when we would just take our kids to places and have them try on a bunch of stuff that other kids have been wearing all day. You know, back before we thought, oh, germs, yeah, we should probably pay attention to those things. Now see, there she was enjoying her day, enjoying her grandparents, enjoying that time. But now on that particular day, this cute, sweet little girl started to cause some problems and do some things that she shouldn't. And that's when Grandma stepped up to the plate. Is that Grandma quite calmly and relaxed, began to explain of what was wrong with her behavior and what she had done wrong and what she needed to do to go ahead and correct what she was doing wrong. So my mom got finished with her spiel and that's when my daughter Abigail looked at her and said, Grandma, what's the big deal? (laughs) It's that... That with all of that spunk and with all of that very fervor is that there she stood, Grandma, what's your point? (laughs) Is that I don't care what you want. I'm going to do what I want to do and that's just the way it's going to be. See, we may find it kind of novel and different to see splashed across our TV screens, things of autonomous zones and occupied protests, but it's not just in Seattle that there are places that are set up to be those places marked off that don't let others in. See, all too often, humanity has been setting up its own autonomous space of I will do my thing my way and I don't care what you have to say, Lord. See, Paul comes in Romans chapter 7 to wrestle, to wrestle with that very place of where does the law fit in the life of the Christian? Is that where does the law fit in the midst of our life in general? Is that where do we find ourselves continuing to live in that tension that we have been freed and forgiven and that we have been given that new life of the Spirit, but that we also are called to live in honor and care and respect and in all of those different ways that are there. So that Paul uses that word law some 23 times in these few short verses of chapter 7. Is that Paul is concerned 
about not only talking about that law, what it is and what it's there for, but talking about us in the very makeup of what we are today, even as those that, who have been redeemed and forgiven and brought into that salvation of Jesus, is that where do we still see these things at work? See, too often we want to go ahead and do things our way. And so Paul begins to wrestle with these things. The where does the law have its say? And in the midst of that very gospel of Jesus Christ that has freed us from the demands of the law, that has freed us from the punishment and the condemnation that it brings, is that where does the law find its place? Now we're not talking about laws in general and rules of the land. Is that we're talking about God's holy will for our lives the very law and commandments of our God. And so what does it mean that Paul throughout Romans says such things as that the law works wrath, chapter 4, verse 15, or that the law increases the fall as we look at chapter 5, verse 20, or that it works the very realization of sin in chapter 3, verse 20 is that it says in our reading today that it's not by the law that any good work has been produced. See, Paul's pretty hard on the law. He said, what does he say? That the fruits of the law that have been produced? Only the very fruit of death, Paul says. See, Paul doesn't give a very positive view of the law. Why? And how did those hearers in that day, and how do we in our day, hear what it is that Paul's having to say? See, Paul asks some very poignant questions that he thinks that those who are hearing and listening might ask. Is that he says, what then shall we say? That the, that the law is sin? By no means. See, the law is not evil. The law is not bad. The law is not something that is just easily brushed aside. But we must see what the law is and what it does in our lives. The law is that very holy and good will of God that points and directs of how we ought to live and how we are to be pleasing to him. But Paul goes on to say these kinds of things as he begins to talk about sin seizing and grabbing hold of us, of sin taking us captive, of sin twisting and turning. See, Paul talks an awful lot about the law here, but he talks an awful lot about sin as well. And we're not just talking about sins, you know, those individual acts of things that we should or we shouldn't have done. But he's talking about that capital S sin. As that sinful, selfish, self-centered demeanor and that outlook that we have as humans. That when God comes to us and says, this is what I desire and we look back with all of our fervor and say, yeah, what's your point? <laughs> God calls to us. He calls to us to see, to see what is at work in our lives. For Paul begins to unpack that that good law that God gave for life, it is something that still works death in our current experience that sin has so taken a hold of us that even after we receive that gift of grace that it continues to continue to place its hand and its grip upon us. But what does Paul go on to say? That he goes on to say that the law, the law is what revealed the very sinfulness that otherwise he wouldn't see. See, that's what's so adorable about a three-and-a-half-year-old talking to grandma the way that she does is that she thinks that there is nothing wrong with what she just did. Is that just talk to her about it. She'll convince you that she's always right. 
But what is it that Paul shows? That Paul shows that the law, the law provides that window that allows the light of God to shine into our lives and to see sin for what it is, not just individual mistakes or issues or problems, but that core, that core outlook in life that says that I'm going to do things my way. See, how does Paul put it today? That he says that if it were not for the law that said, you shall not covet, that I would not have known it. See, Paul says that 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 commandment on coveting, that it's not just the outward acts of our hands or our words, but it's even the very thoughts and desires that work within us that show our very sinfulness. Is that if he had not seen what God's law had now shown a light on, is that Paul would have blissfully gone on thinking, man, I am just one great and wonderful Pharisee. But God's law showed him for who he truly was. See, St. Augustine once reflect upon this same reality in his own life. St. Augustine thought and reflected all the way back upon something that he had done decades before. That back when he was in his teens, is that he and some friends went ahead and broke into a neighbor's orchard and they went into all of those things, is that broke broke into their pear orchard, stole some of the fruit, and he reflects still on this incident some many years later. And he tries to understand Why did he do it? And why is he still concerned about it? That he said that I was neither hungry, nor was I impoverished, nor did I even like pears. In fact, after they stole the pears, they just basically threw them to the hogs. But he's still haunted with this question of why did I do it? For the very fact that someone said, don't. That he saw at work in his body and his life that very sin rearing its ugly head that I will do what I will do even if I don't want to do it. That I'm going to do it just because somebody told me I shouldn't. St. Augustine reflects upon this is that where in myself and where does such defiance come from? See, I heard a story of another little boy you know, who once reflected in this way. He was overheard by his mother as he was saying his prayers at night as he spoke to the Lord a very heartfelt prayer of saying, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a real fine time just the way that I am. See, St. Augustine, when he was young, A young adult in his 20s, he says that my prayer at that time was, God, give me holiness, but not yet. (laughs) See, too often we allow sin to rear its ugly head. But what is it that the law is there to do? It's there to show us where we are and where we stand and where we have fallen short. And it's that law that continues to show where we are we need to confess. Just think of that rich young ruler who came running up to Jesus in the Gospels. Just think of that rich young ruler who came and threw himself down and asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what does it then say? Jesus tells the man, he said, well, what What does the law say? And the man recites all of those things that he's done and all of those ways that he's fulfilled, everything that is there. And it says in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved him. For here was this deluded and delusional man who says that I've kept the law in all of its entirety And then Jesus, I'm pretty convinced, with a smirk on his face, said, 
There's just one thing that you lack. Just one small, eensy, bitsy, teeny weeny thing. Just go and sell your possessions, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And what does it say happened to that man on that day? That he went away sad. Why? Because the light of God's law shone in upon him that day. All of his covetousness, all of his desire, all of the things that were there lurking under the surface that he just pretended away. See, Jesus and Paul and so many others call for us to remember, to remember where we're at, to look not just out there into this world and to not cast judgment and aspersions of look at all of those lawbreakers and look at all of those people and look at all of those things that are done over there or at least I'm not like him or at least I don't do that or at least, at least, at least. You don't even need to worry about holding yourself up to everything that God commands. Stop for a few days and simply try to hold yourself up to all of your demands. Not just your demands for yourself, but all of those things that you would demand and expect of others. Are you even able to live up to your own standards of what is good? That is what Paul is talking about in our reading, is that he proclaims to us is that Christ came and died on our behalf, that he died that we may die, so that we may no longer live under the very slavery to sin or the very bondage to the law, but that we may now live by the spirit of freedom. See, at the end of Romans chapter 7, we get to that climax. We get to that very thing that Paul sees all of his problems, all of his pains, everything weighing down upon him, and he proclaims out, he said, what a wretched man am I who will save me from this, this body of death. And with praise, Jesus, Paul says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is it that Paul sees? Paul sees that it's in the very place of Jesus taking our place under the law. Jesus taking our place under condemnation. Jesus fulfilling what we ought to or should have done. That Jesus takes our very place. And instead, he gives us freedom. He gives us life. He gives us the Spirit. He gives us a reason to sing and praise for He has dealt with the sin that still holds on to us because He has taken us and made us His own. See, what is it that Paul yearns for? He yearns to not simply be removed from this body of death, but he yearns for that day that this body, this body so affected by sin, that this body may finally return to be the very instrument of God's grace and goodness, to be that instrument of God's law of holiness and righteousness, and that we might live in that peace that is ours in Christ. That Paul yearns for the instrument of our body that God has given that it would once again be set right. That may we yearn. That may we yearn for that day that Jesus will come again, that we may be freed from sin. But even today, while we may not know that in this body, in this age, in this time, that we know it in the very promise that our God has given that in the very Spirit of God, that He has washed us of our sins, claimed us as His own, and invited us to walk with Him, knowing that we are not simply seen as wretched people, but we are seen as the beloved and chosen servants of the One who loved us so much. As Paul begins our reading today off, that we are the beloved brides of Christ. 
may we continue to celebrate that he is the one who gave himself fully that we may be fully known by him. That may that peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you again for joining us today for our online worship. Don't forget to fill out the online attendance form which you'll find in the video's description. And also feel free to update your contact information there or submit any prayer requests you might have. Also, we'd love to have you join us for the conclusion of Vacation Bible School Sunday night at 6 p.m. We'd loved experiencing all of the ways that Jesus' power pulls us through together with the children of Calvary and our community. And we would love to have you, your neighbors, and your friends join us for this fun-filled conclusion and a special treat. Also, if you've missed any of the days of VBS, don't hesitate to check out clcs.org VBS, where we have all of the past videos, crafts, and games from VBS this week. And they'll stay up for you to check out throughout the summer. Finally, we're continuing to collect breakfast items and hygiene items to support the Chin community through Franciscan Health. Feel free to bring those donations anytime to one of our worship services or throughout the week from nine to noon. That's it in the way of announcements for today. So now we turn to our Lord as we prepare our hearts through our offering prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you have blessed us with so many things. And today, as we bring these gifts into your storehouse, help us to bring them in the confidence that you will use them to your glory and the good of our neighbor. Bless us as we go out into this community to share your good news with the world, the hope of salvation which we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. These things we pray in his blessed name. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near to the throne of grace, trusting the Lord to hear the prayers of his people and answer our petitions according to his mercy. O most merciful God, govern your church that she may be preserved in your saving word. Defend us against all adversity and protect us from our adversaries, that our faith may be strengthened and our love increased. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Lord of heaven and earth, grant wisdom, health, and integrity to all in authority over us, especially to our president, our governor, Congress, all legislative bodies, and all judges. According to your gracious will, help us as a nation to walk together in humility and peace. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Gracious Father, grant to those in trouble, sickness, or any adversity the spirit of your grace. Bring healing, strength, comfort, and relief. Hear us this day, we pray, on behalf of John Main and Ben Pence as they are hospitalized, and on behalf of Landon Gaskins and Cecilia Currier as each of them recovers from surgery. We ask your blessing in the lives of Sue Ann Hanchi, Janelle McCoy, Angie Ransdell, Jennifer Kraft, Kristen Yates, Irma LaRue, Mike Norizzi, Kenny Keller, and Floyd Main. Be with each of them, Lord, as in their need, and grant them strength and healing as they draw near to you. Be with Tony Reese, Bernice Ross, Gertrude Hyden, Al Durkee, Debbie Reese, and Marcella Dickmeyer, that each of them might know that peace which comes from your presence. And Lord, we come to you in thanksgiving for the birth of Lillian Rachel Moore, granddaughter of John and Kim Moore, and Mike and Jennifer Dakey. Be with the family as they celebrate this new gift of life and as they all draw close to you to raise Lillian up in faith and life and fervent love for you. 
Lord, all of these things and more we lift up before you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God of compassion, preserve us from pestilence and every evil. Lend your blessing to all honorable vocations and industries, that we may serve wherever our abilities may be of good use. Bless those who are in need at this time, and give us generous hearts to support and care for one another. Be with our medical community as they continue to care for all affected by the global pandemic. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Holy Father, bless the homes and families of your people that they may be places where your name is honored and our love is nurtured. Give your special grace to the widowed, the orphan, the foreigner, the aged, and the infirm, that we may grant them comfort, aid, and pr protection. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. All these things we ask of, your trust, of you, trusting in your mercy, confident that you will give answer to our prayers. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.